Adieu la vie, adieu l'amour, adieu toutes les femmes. C'est bien fini, c'est pour toujours de cette guerre infâme. C'est à crâne sur le plateau qu'on doit laisser sa peau. Car nous sommes tous condamnés. Hello, students, and good morning, afternoon, evening, or night, depending on when you are joining us for this, a guest lecture on the French Army mutinies of 1917 for History 119, the First World War. My name is Professor Adam Zentek, and I will be your guide for this journey. So let's just jump right into it, shall we? Early 1917 was a very bad time for the French Army. The winter was unusually cold. Soldiers remembered it as the time that their wine froze in their canteens. Not only did this make for an uncomfortable winter in the trenches, but it also meant that people behind the lines, right, families and farms, the, the, the very things that the French soldier was ostensibly fighting to protect, they also suffered through the weather. And for the first time in the war, there were real shortages on the home front. Moreover, Reports from the time in the French military archives suggest very strongly that drunkenness was spreading throughout the ranks, in particular in the winter again of 1916-1917. General Robert Niville promised to end all of this suffering. He replaced France's old commander-in-chief, General Joseph Joff. Joff, who was known amongst the, the British as the, quote, super frog, and always ate the same dinner of mutton and champagne for dinner every single night led the French to victory in the Battle of the Marne, but was also behind those bloody offensives of 1915, was replaced for lack of, of ingenuity and imagination in December of 1916, and Neville was his replacement. Now, Neville was something of a sexy beast. He was promoted over the head of another commander, Henri-Philippe Pétain, who, who probably should have taken the command because he was flashy, because he spoke English fluently and got along well with the British, but most importantly because he promised an end to the war. He said, we have the formula. He thought that he could end the war with one more big offensive in the spring of 1917. So this formula was a new concept, a, a, a concept for an offensive, uh, an Anglo-French offensive on the Western Front. Now, Neville's concept for this offensive was for two great simultaneous attacks to take place, on opposite side of a large bulge in the German positions around the town of Noyon, called the Noyon Salient. The British would attack southeast from the town of Arras, uh, on a line actually from Arras to Baupum, and, and would attack southeast and pinch the northern part of the salient, while the French would attack from the, 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 the south, right, and they would move northeast into the German positions along a line that ran roughly from the town of Soissons to that of Rez in the east. The French then would pinch the southern side of the salient in this big dual envelopment motion. Now, Neville's plan was that, that once this envelopment was set into motion, the Germans would be forced to move all of their strategic reserves in the, in, in the region into this, this pocket that was developing in order to prevent being overrun from the rear. And at this point, was Neville, Neville's innovation, was that instead of trying to turn a flank, instead of trying to get to the rear and, and take territory, he would simply take a mailed fist of French soldiers, what he called the maneuver force, and smash it directly into the middle of the German positions. And the idea was that these two attacks, one from the north, one from the south, and then one from the center, would force Germany into a huge cataclysmic battle that it would not be able to win. The idea, in other words, wasn't to take territory, wasn't to roll up a flank, it was to annihilate the German army in the field. Now, part of the formula would be the use of a relatively new artillery tactic, the moving or creeping or rolling barrage. In a moving barrage, the army's artillery provides a curtain of fire that lifts at specific predetermined points and moves on to another part of the enemy sector. And so you can see in this diagram here, which is a British diagram, but it gives a good idea of the way a rolling barrage works that from zero to eight minutes, it hits this first opening barrage line. For eight more minutes, it hits another line. Eight more minutes, it hits another, and so on and so forth. So in this particular artillery solution, there is a lift every eight minutes, and the infantry is supposed to follow right behind the, the, the curtain of shells as it moves. So thereby, they can follow actually quite close because 
all the shells obviously explode according to the vector of their trajectory, which is, which is down and forward. So you can walk pretty closely behind a, a moving barrage and not be struck by shrapnel or by high explosive. The idea was to make sure that the German defenders remained in their dugouts until the very last moment, when the attackers could be upon them, dropping into their trenches before the defenders had time to mount their, their defense, to get to their, their machine guns, for instance. So long as the infantry could keep pace with the creep, and so long as the creep was sufficiently destructive, the thinking went, the infantry could be protected and simply walk across no man's land. Uh, it, it, the attack for the infantry would become a mere lark. A simple stroll. Such at least was the idea. But, but it didn't take long for the Germans to ruin Neville's plans and, and, and ruin his concept. In late February and through March 1917, both because it had good intelligence that an offensive was coming and because it was impossible for the British and the French to obscure the buildup and armaments that, were, that, that they were making throughout this sector, along, in the French case in particular, an old carriage road beloved by Louis uh, 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 the six, no, I'm sorry, Louis XV's daughters called the, the Chemin de Dame. And so the Germans withdraw from this Noyon salient, which was the whole object of the original concept of the Chemin de Dame offensive. And so the Germans simply pull back east, r remove themselves from the salient that was going to be the object of the attack. They retreated to a set of fortified positions called the Hindenburg Line and they raised the ground that they moved across, destroying structures, poisoning wells, killing livestock, even chopping down apple trees to make sure that when the French moved into this new position, there would be nothing there. <laughs> and actually a neat fact, uh, the retreat to the Hindenburg Line sits, sets the stage for the movie 1917, which came out, uh, I believe, about a year and a half ago. Uh, that features men moving across this decimated landscape towards the Hindenburg Line. So retreat to the Hindenburg Line both shortened the front and hardened it. It freed up divisions and it gave these divisions shelter in, in, a, in a very complex series of interlocking trenches, some of which were even nine layers deep, uh, usually with artillery that was sighted uh, uh, from the, the reverse slopes of hills and with enormous underground caverns to store uh, 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 people and weapons. So once the Germans withdrew, Neville's concept for the offensive was kind of well, screwed, because there was no more salient to pinch off. But rather than revise his plans, Neville, ever confident, insisted that his concept did not even require a salient, that the French could simply attack northeast along the Chemin de Dame in force and force that decisive battle there. Other generals, Henri-Philippe Pétain in particular, opposed this. They thought it would be suicidal. But Neville then promised at this meeting uh, uh, of, of, of all the, the, the French commanders and the highest ranking politicians in the country. Neville says, all right, fine. If, if you don't want to attack, like I say, then I will resign my command immediately. But if you do allow me to uh, attack and the attack does not go according to plan, I will, I will resign in shame after 48 hours. That's the promise he made. He promised France's soldiers too, as well, that this would be the last push, be the last effort and all their suffering would come to an end. And so Nivelle got what he wanted. Uh, and as a result, he has the dubious honor of being the only general to have a battle on the Western Front named after him, the Nivelle Offensive, the tragic farce that was the Nivelle Offensive. The attack was scheduled to take place in mid-April. In preparation, the French assembled the densest concentration of firepower in the history of the world up until that point much more than was at Verdun on both sides combined, much more than was at the, the, the Somme with both sides combined. Uh, for more than a week in early April, French guns, there were 5,500 guns, fired more than 7 million projectiles into the German positions along a stretch of about 20 kilometers long and about five or so kilometers deep. French soldiers who watched the spectacle from their attack trenches were in awe and they could grow in confidence, thinking that nothing alive, nothing, could survive such a fierce and destructive preparatory bombardment. And on the early morning of April 16th, 1917, the French left their trenches and attacked, to be cut down by almost unscathed German defenders. The bombardment, as dense and powerful as it was, failed to damage significantly even the first two lines of German defenses. And as I said, in some places along the Chemin de Dame, there, there were six, eight, or nine lines of trenches. 
Moreover, the French barrage often moved too quickly for the infantry. It, 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 its creep wasn't so much of a creep. It, it was going too fast, and it left the infantry behind without any kind of fire support trapped in no man's land. Finally, because of bad weather and communications problems, French aircraft could not communicate this back to the gunners in the rear. And so the guns just went on their set schedule uh, and left everybody behind. And at the end of this first disastrous day, 57 of Nivelle's 132 tanks had been completely destroyed and 64 had become bogged down, which means almost all the tanks that were employed on the Chemin de Dame were casualties. They were killed in the first couple of hours. And there were thousands upon thousands of casualties. The French suffered 140,000 dead, the highest of any one month since September and August in 1914, before the trenches were even dug. After defeats along nearly the entire Chemin de Dame front, French generals from the fire-breathing General Mangin to the cautious Pétain gave up hope for any kind of success. Nivelle lost the confidence of his soldiers, his commanders, and his government. And on May 15th, in a state of disgrace, he was officially relieved of his command, although he was replaced in practice about two weeks earlier with Henri-Philippe Pétain. And as nearly his first act, Pétain famously promised the men that the French army, instead of continuing along the Chemin de Dame, would henceforth wait for the, quote, Americans and the tanks before undertaking any new offenses. And a little point of, uh, of, of, of specification, Pétain is often quoted as saying, we will wait for the Americans and their tanks. But the Americans never brought tanks, right? The correct quote is the Americans and the tanks, as in our French tanks. Because the, the French tank corps was by far the most sophisticated in, in the world during the First World War. Now, in the meantime, the army's morale went south. Neville had, remember, promised his soldiers, tired of war, wanting desperately for the war to end so that they could return home to their suffering farms and families. He told them that this would be the final effort, that they could end the war in the next couple of days with their heroism. But when the attack failed so ingloriously and so quickly, there was a precipitous drop in morale. The, the men felt lied to. They felt deceived. The cold, the suffering behind the lines, the miserable trench conditions, and now the horrible disillusionment that followed the collapse of the Chemin de Dame offensive. Right, only in a couple of hours, this offensive failed. All this made for a heady anti-war brew. And in late April, French units along the Chemin de Dame began to rebel when they were ordered to take up the trenches and attack. The very first mutiny took place in the 20th Regiment of Infantry on April 29th of 1917, about two weeks after the offensive began, when 200 men from the regiment who had been drinking together protested their rotation into the trenches and refused to show up. Although once they sobered up the next day, they all came back under uh, military discipline. And between May 2nd and May 19th, there were around 15 similar uncoordinated events. Men who were ordered to take their position in the trenches simply didn't show up for roll call, or when they did, showed up shouting things like, down with the war. Now, it's not really easy to get at what the mutineers actually wanted, because almost all the sources that we have, obviously, are from the point of view of commanders who are writing letters to one another, decrying what they were seeing. It's not like the mutineers were publishing their own newspaper that you could look at. But there are extensive records in the French military archives from the postal censorship commission, the Control Postal. And in the Control Postal, I managed to find one small extract from a letter from a soldier from the 20th Regiment of Infantry who was riding home to his family, describing what happened in, in this first of all the mutinies and what the mutineers wanted. He said, for our part, our sole desire is to see the end of the war. And as you have seen, the manner in which it ends is not important to us. This man just wanted to, quote, get out of this slavery to see our lives, our little ones, and to work freely as before. You talk about revolution, he said. It is coming fast, and there is nothing to do now but wait. The revolution of which he spoke was, of course, an anti-war revolution. The mutinies themselves were this revolution's leading edge. Now, the 162nd Regiment of Infantry had also been part of the attacks on April 16th and suffered very heavily. It was rotated out of the trenches in early May, and then on May 21st, ordered back in. That night, during a presumably morale-building theater performance, 
a group of some 500 inebriated men overran the production, singing the Internationale, which is always a bad sign, and calling out, quote, down with the war, we want rest and leave, death to shirkers, death to officers. The disorder continued the following day, when men from the regiment were found drinking with others from a different regiment, the 267th RI, in a local bar, which was fittingly called La Folie, or Madness. These men, when confronted by their officers, said similar things to what they had before. They claimed that they would not fight. The unit was then taken further in the rear and quarantined on May 24th, investigated for a few days, with some soldiers punished with jail time. It was then put back into battle. So in a certain strict sense, the mutiny of the 162nd Regiment of Infantry failed. The mutineers got punished, and the unit ended up in the trenches anyway. But in another sense, the actions of the 162nd Regiment of Infantry were enormously successful, because it established a kind of repertoire, a, a, a script of protest that could be used by other units throughout the front. And so acts of indiscipline that were very similar to those in form uh, of the 162nd suddenly just spread rapidly throughout the Shemenda Dam region. Between May 27th and 31st, there were 18 more mutinies. And then between June 1st and 7th, there were 35. And again, these mutinies tended to follow the same formula. After receiving news that they were going up to the front again, men went out and drank together sometimes in camp, but often in local bars or cafes, where they were shielded from the surveillance of command, and got one another pumped up with anti-war sentiments. They would then spill out of this bar or this camp and confront their officers, and call at their most ambitious for an end to the war and permanent world peace, and, and at their most modest for better food, better drink, better, better living conditions, and an end to the really wasteful form of offensives that had been pursued through 1915, 16, and 17. And how these actually played out on the ground had a lot to do with micro-situational dynamics, which is to say the interactions, emotional and physical, between commanders and soldiers in, in, in a moment-to-moment -moment way. Now, put another way, the early acts of indiscipline along the Shemenda Dam provided a script for protest and mutiny. They, they provided what the sociologist Charles Tilley has called a, quote, repertoire of contention, which he defines as a claims-making routine right, a kind of performance that allows one group to make claims upon another. Now, in Tilly's thinking, repertoires of contention are modular, meaning that they can spread from one group to another and thus spread through a population. This, I want to argue, is exactly what happened during the French army mutinies. The repertoire of contention established early on in April and May provided men at the front with a basic script as to how to mutiny. They would drink together and then form this intense but short-lived emotional community that pumped itself up and was determined to act out against the war. They would then confront officers and make various forms of demands, sometimes violently, depending on how the officers responded. When the officers responded with generosity and sympathy, the, the, the mutinies tended to be rather civil. When the officers responded with threats of violence or punishment, then the mutinies themselves became violent. So about 120 of these events took place overall. And then this contentious repertoire spread backwards along the rail lines that connected the rear to the Shemenda Dam and over which men who were going on leave and coming back from leave were traveling. There were around 250 similar events, similar to what I just described from the 162nd Regiment of Infantry, in trains and train stations between June and the end of July of 1917. What I would like to do in the rest of this lecture is look at some case studies from the mutinies to see how this repertoire of contention spread and how mutineers elaborated upon it. That is the mutiny of the 18th RI and the 82nd Brigade of Infantry, or BI, and a dramatic event at the train station of Chateau Derry on July 3rd, where soldiers took over the whole station and had to be removed by force. But first, I want to provide a quick quantitative overview of the mutinies as a whole. Now, as we've already seen, the indiscipline along the Chemin de Dames started in late April of 1917, spread slowly through the first couple of weeks of March, and then spiked after the mutiny of the 162nd Regiment of Infantry on May 21st. Now, at first, commanders thought that they were seeing just ordinary discontent. They, they didn't think about this, this series of mutinies as a series, but rather as isolated events. But in late May, after this, this number spiked so dramatically, they changed their mind. 
The mutinies reached a peak on June 1st when 10 separate events took place, and the army, realizing it was in a severe crisis, cracked down in ways that we will investigate later in the lecture. The number of mutinies at the front then declined precipitously, but at the same time this happened, the number of, of revolts on trains and in train stations spiked precipitously. So there was an exchange of one form of indiscipline for another, a transfer of the repertoire of contention from the front to train stations and trains themselves. The events at the train stations reached their peak two weeks later, on June 14, when 12 separate events took place. And, 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 and perhaps most threateningly for commanders, these events that were taking place in train stations weren't just happening close to the Chemin de Dame, they were taking place as far back as Dunkirk, in Normandy, or Kemper, uh, in, 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 in Brittany, about as far away as you could possibly get from the Western Front and still remain in France. Now, when we put the two graphs together, we get a graph that looks something like this. A steep rise up beginning May 27, a plateau through the entire month of June, and a decline in indiscipline through the month of July, through the first two weeks in particular of July. All told, there were some 350 separate events that directly involved somewhere between 80 and 100,000 soldiers. Thus, somewhere around 5% of the army participated in the mutinies directly, and a much greater percent sympathized. So what happened on May 27 to catalyze the spread of that contentious repertoire used by mutineers? Well, there was a serious mutiny in the 18th Regiment of Infantry that day that took the repertoire used by the 162nd and elaborated upon it. Now, the 18th RI also saw combat uh, along the Chemin de Dame during the offensive. It was rotated into the trenches on April 23rd, rotated out on May 8th, and put in rest in the rear on May 12th. On May 27th, the men in this regiment received news that they would be heading back into the trenches, probably for another attack. And a group of several dozen of them went to a local bar. Not incidentally, the exact same bar, La Folie, that the men of the 162nd had been at before. And remember, they there drank with men from the 267th. And the 267th men were in the bar when the men from the 18th RI came in. And so they had actual eyewitnesses to the mutiny of the 162nd to drink with and talk story with and learn from. And it was there in this bar that they learned about the mutiny and they learned about the contentious performance. In other words, they learned what to do, and they decided to follow in the 162nd Regiment of Infantry's footsteps. Now, at about 6.30 in the evening, some 50 men came out from the bar and found their commanding officer, whom they shouted at, yelled at, but that officer broke up the party. The men then returned to the same bar, you know, chastened ostensibly, or at least, or at least uh, uh, intimidated, and they drank more. They drank more and more and more. And that same officer then came to the bar to drag the men out. But the soldiers refused to leave. It is not our turn to fight, one said. And while it is unclear exactly what happened, because the, the reports vary, apparently men in the bar attacked their officers and beat them up, chased them out, and drove them out of the little town in which they were billeted. The men then piled into the streets. Estimates of the crowd of mutineers were about 100 to 200 men, where they tore up the pavés, built barricades in, in, in the best French style, fired their weapons in the air, and destroyed the very lorries, the buses, that were supposed to take them up to the front. They shot them up with machine guns and threw grenades at them. Now again, it's obviously hard to know exactly what these men wanted, and the reports from the archives are usually written from the point of view of commanders who were horrified and unsympathetic. But there is a transcript in the military archives of one interview with one of the mutineers, which gives some indication as to what these people were thinking. Now, the man who was executed the very next morning that, after he gave this testimony, and therefore had no reason whatsoever to lie, explained that he was motivated by, quote, a hatred of the war, and that he had acted, quote, in order to stop this butchery. The report that contained this uh, had a note saying, quote, these were his exact words. He considered himself, in his words again, a martyr for the revolution and he had no regret for his actions, and was not sad that he would be executed. He thought, in other words, that he was one of the, the, the first to start the ball rolling and to end the war 
through the direct action of soldiers themselves. And very fortunately for me, another participant wrote home of his experience in a letter that was captured by the French Postal Censorship Service, the Control Postal. And this is what he said. We guessed that this was the revolution and everybody was in a rage. We chugged down the wine, they called Pinard, and off we went. We stopped the commander and we would like to do you know what to him. I jump in a bound and get my pistol. Then I head towards the officers crying out, to the death. They got out of there. It was great to see. And so this repertoire of contention employed by the 18th RI was clearly indebted to that of the 162nd. After all, men in the, uh, 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 the latter group learned about what men from the 162nd RI did in the very bar that men from the 162nd RI planned their mutiny. And it was motivated by the same anti-war sentiments. Men chanted the same thing, down with the war, death to officers. We want better food, we want better shelter, we want world peace, a grab bag. Of, uh, uh, of different grievances. The next day, the, uh, the, the, the whole camp, the 18th RI's camp, was surrounded by the forces of order. And the men, hung over and tired, with no more ammunition, they had spent it all blowing up their lorries, and no more will to resist, came back under military authority. And of them, 130 were arrested and punished, most with a month or two in jail. Five were sentenced to death, and four were actually executed. The, the fifth, the legendary Vincent Mulia, Sergeant Vincent Mulia, who was, who was scheduled to be executed one day, and that night, the night before he was going to be executed, a German shell came and smashed the jail he was staying in and blew it up, which allowed him to escape. And he made it all the way to Spain, where he stayed until the 1930s. Now, after the 18th RI's mutiny spread, there was a positive explosion of indiscipline, as we have seen. Now, no single mutiny rift on the repertoire of contention in ways as dramatic and violent as did that of the 82nd Brigade of Infantry. This unit, an elite fighting unit, was the very tip of the spear on April 16th during the attack and suffered absolutely horrendous casualties. It was rotated out from the trenches on April 25th, its manpower shortly after replenished, and then sent back on May 4th into the very same trenches from which it had been evacuated, just a week or so prior. On May 12th, the unit rotated out, and on May 24th, after two weeks of rest, it moved to the town of ville en tardenois just south of the city of Rez. On June 1st, at around noon, the men from the regiment received unwelcome news. At midnight, they would be moving up into the trenches, and they would be attacking once again. Now, soon after receiving the orders, a group of about 100 men confronted one of their officers, who fought back and roughed up a few guys. This seemed to cow the men, who went back to their billets. But an hour or so later, the very same men formed another group of about 150, and they began marching around the town, calling out, quote, down with the war, the same slogans that the 162nd and the 18th regiments of infantry had used during their mutinies. But once again, they were cowed, this time by the, the brigade's commanding general, the highest ranking officer with whom they would be likely to have any interaction, who personally marched them back to their billets. This time, once they returned, the men broke out the wine and began to drink. And then when, at, uh, at about 6.30 p.m., they came out of their camp into the streets of Ville and Tardonois, uh, they, were, they were extremely drunk, described as a band of drunkards, a bunch of drunkards, and a bunch of drunken thugs in the reports that were filed afterwards. This crowd, though, was much larger, too. It, it, it numbered about 600 men. And again, the commanders confronted the crowd. But this time, instead of backing down, the men pressed forwards and shouted at their commanders for more than an hour. Some of the commanders broke down into tears, seeing that they had lost control over their troops. This only served to make the mutineers more aggressive and more confident. The crowd grew, too, numbering at, at its greatest at about 2,000 men. The brigade's general, of the unfortunate General Bulow, lamented, quote, I had before me the complete spectacle of an unchained mob. And so surrounded by angry and drunk soldiers, the commanders of the brigade retreated in, 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 to, their, to their headquarters in, inside the town hall of Villain-Tardenois. And the town hall was soon surrounded. The men, again described in reports as drunkards, drunken thugs, and a group of drunkards, drunken band, they started throwing rocks and pieces of wood at the town hall, breaking the windows. The, 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 the officers had to put furniture 
uh, from the town hall up against the doors and the windows to prevent people from getting in. And the soldiers called out for hours, murderers, blood drinkers at their own commanders, whom they were trying to get to. It appeared that the situation would turn tragic at any minute, said one general who was there. And we were afraid that the general, that is General Boulot, squeezed in and shoved around, would find himself in a rather tight spot. That was an understatement. As midnight approached, though, the men who had laid siege to the town hall began to tire. Some wandered off to vandalize the town and look for more wine. Others tried to spread the mutiny to a, uh, to a neighboring camp, but were driven away by sentries under force of arms. Others just passed out in the field somewhere. And when they woke up and they were sober, the will to resist had seemingly evaporated. The unit, as were the others, was moved to a quarantine camp and isolated. Soldiers were all interviewed by uh, special investigators over a series of days, and this brigade was punished more harshly than any other in the army, with 250 men arrested and punished, 30 very seriously, and four executed. Now, at this point, Pétain, the commander of the army, intervened. Now, on the one hand, what he did was crack down on indiscipline, aggressively pursuing the, uh, the alleged ringleaders of different mutinies, and generously sentencing people to be executed. In fact, Paris had to intervene because he had sentenced so many people to be executed, and, and, and they gave a whole bunch of commutations. Patin also began to use cracked attachments to, to patrol the rear and constantly surveil what was happening in army camps. The army also closed many wine shops and pro prohibited the importation of wine into the front other than that which was strictly necessary for the French army's own wine rations, which at this time were half a liter per man per day. Indeed, over the month of June, in his search for ringleaders, Batin purged nearly a thousand men from the army who had lengthy disciplinary records for drunkenness. He sent them in work battalions to the Sahara so they could dry out for the remainder of the war. On the other hand, Patin addressed some of the complaints of the men, promising better food, better living conditions, more leave and rest, which they got, and an end to the, the, the wasteful offensives from 1915, 16, and 17. He more or less made good on these promises over the summer, but the effects were not felt right away. Indeed, with all the wine shops closed and camps now under strict surveillance, it became very difficult to act out the, the, this repertoire of contention at the front. The indiscipline then began to migrate backwards, beginning in June, along again the train lines that connected the Chemin de Dam with, with the rear. These stations could then become dramatic sites of confrontation between officers and men. Consider, for instance, the events of July 3rd, 1917, in the train station of Chateau Thierry. Train number RM Bis, traveling from Paris to the Chemin de Dam front and carrying men returning from the very leave that Pétain had just given them, was full of troublemakers, or meneurs, as they're described in the reports. Before the train pulled into the station at about 6.40 p.m., Chateau Thierry's officers had already been warned twice about rowdiness. But the men on the train were reserved and quiet during the stop, quite puzzlingly. It was only once the train began to pull out of the station that they revolted, calling out, quote, you sons of bitches, down with the cops, death to the pigs, long live liberty. When, when the, the, the station security forces tried to make a few arrests, a, quote, loud and rowdy mob, as one of them described it, attacked the security forces, beating them up and driving them out of the station. And so about an hour later, the security forces retreated from, from the station, leaving the station entirely in the hands of the mutineers, who, of course, vandalized it and, 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 and tore up the trains. But these guys had nowhere to go. Like, where would the mutineers go? They were trapped at this train station and they soon ran out of the wine that was fueling their indiscipline. At around five in the morning the next day, the forces of order returned, numbering 500 crack and heavily armed troops. 13 men at Chateau Thierry were arrested and the train departed quietly at, at, at eight, three hours later. Now, this was one of about 250 similar events that took place during the month of June and into early July. These likely involved some 30, 40, 50,000 men, all told. And in most cases, the language that these guys used was the same as that which was used at the front. Men asked for an end to the war, and for now, better conditions and more leave and rest. This was, in other words, 
a modification of that repertoire of contention established early in April of, of, of 1917, now migrating backwards towards the rear. Drink and get pumped up, encounter officers, threaten them and demand radical change in the army, and then the next morning sober up and come back under military discipline. Now, though, this repertoire was being performed in a new situational context. This is the way one participant described a revolt. Again, uh, something that was picked up from the, the control postal. I have never seen a train coming back from leave so excited, singing revolutionary songs and crying out down with the war, peace, long live the revolution, and other such things, and more. At every stop, descending from the train and breaking open the barrels of wine that we found on the platforms, we drank wine for free, and I took the opportunity to fill my canteen. Now, Patent's plan to stop the indiscipline on trains mirrored his plan to stop the indiscipline at the front. He ordered alcohol shops like cafes and bars closed in all the train stations along uh, that, that connected to the Chemendon, and eventually in all train stations through which soldiers traveled. This prevented men from drinking on the trains, obviously. He also uh, started sending crack detachments to patrol the trains themselves to surveil men and assure that they weren't drinking wine that they had brought with them. By the second week of July, the trains were dry and the indiscipline had ceased. So now that we've gone through a few representative cases and shown that the mutinies were, were in effect a case of the viral spread of a repertoire of contention, we can address more thoroughly the causes, which we can generally sort into two baskets, the macro and the micro. Historians of the mutinies have tended to focus on the macro, which is to say disillusionment with army command in the war following the failure of the Shemendadam offensive, long-standing grievances about their treatment by the army, and the callousness of the offensive they had been forced to fight, and of course more rest and more leave. Many of these demands were actually met during the summer of 1917, which has led some historians to argue that the mutinies effectively ended when the army caved, when soldiers got what they wanted. In other words, the effect of this repertoire of contention was, was to demand certain things, and it worked. They got the things they demanded. And so the command relationship was effectively renegotiated to the soldier's benefit. That, according to this interpretation, is why they came back under military discipline. Now, the explanation is, I think, partially right. All those macro factors were certainly in play. But to understand how the mutinies played out on the ground, micro-situational factors, such as drinking and the violence it precipitated, could be very important. You can consider, for instance, the mutiny in the 10th Brigade of Infantry, where there was no violence whatsoever. The entire thing was characterized by an almost exaggerated respect between commanders and soldiers who engaged, in this case, in a literal negotiation as to what they were willing to do. But this mutiny was very unique. It, it was one of only two mutinies out of the 120 in which there is positive evidence that, that nobody was drinking, nobody was drunk. That, that was part of this, this brigade's uh, uh, interpretation of the repertoire of contention. They thought that they would be taken more seriously if they didn't drink. And additionally, the, the officers in the 10th Brigade of Infantry were generally well-liked and respected. And so this mutiny did not turn violent at all, although the majority featured some form of violence. While most historians of the mutinies have noted that the mutineers were drunk, they have tended to explain this drunkenness away, saying that the alcohol simply disinhibited men and thus led them to do things they would not normally do, led them to blow off steam, as it were, in this nomadic model of emotional dynamics. But this gets it all wrong. That's, that's not how emotions work. They, they don't build up. They're not nomadic. It, and alcohol is not disinhibitory in a nomadic sense. This is not a case of pressure building up and then drunkenness serving as an excuse for a release. This is too simplistic, and it mi misrepresents the way that intoxication and patterns of microsituational violence actually work. Rather, I think it is much more likely that men drank together because they wanted to mutiny, and they knew that drinking together would be a way to raise their group emotional energy so that they could overcome this barrier of fear and tension that, that, that was obviously erected when they confronted their officers. Now, the, the thing is, if those officers backed down, as, as was the case in the mutinies we looked at, the, the 162nd, the 18th, and the 82nd, the result would be a chaotic and violent protest against the war 
that was intended to spark more, more protests, that was intended to spread. In other words, these men who revolted considered themselves agents, right? Historical agents with, with the power, the ability to change things. They were part of an anti-war movement within the army itself. And at least so long as they were inebriated, they were willing to fight for an end to the war. The mutinies ended then not only with a kind of appeasement on behalf of commanders, who agreed to some of the mutineers' requests, and not only because the punishments and the repression, but also with the imposition of an alcohol prohibition along the front. This assured that the only wine soldiers would get from this point forward would be wine that the army itself gave to them. In other words, one of the reasons why the mutinies ended when they did was because their fuel was dried up. 